All right, thank you for that lovely introduction and stalling. Um, my name is Julian. Uh, today, I was not planning on speaking. Um, I was hoping maybe just to organize this time, but we had a couple cancellations, and I wanted to make sure we had some Gutenberg content. Um, so what I'm doing today is kind of walking us through a short version of a workshop that I gave at WordCamp Europe. It was a three hour long workshop. So um, just bear with me here because what I want to do is I'm going to make sure we all have a chance to look at a lot of this code. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask in a couple minutes you know, what kind of experience we have. Some of this might look a little crazy just depending on where you are. I put the slides link in here, but to be honest, after I thought about it for a second, we really don't need it because I'm going to be um, showing so much code off which I will give you a link to the code at the end. So uh, just a quick introduction. I'm Julian. Um, I'm the technical director at CraftBeak. We make websites for breweries. Um, my Twitter handle is right there if you want to take a picture or tell me that I'm wrong. Um, I like dogs and motorcycling, and I've been really into traveling over the last couple years. Uh, just came back from WordCamp Europe in Belgrade, Serbia, which is where I gave this workshop. Um, with Zach Gordon, and he's a pretty popular educator in the WordPress space, and he's doing a lot of JavaScript stuff and Gutenberg stuff. So um, I will say I highly recommend taking his course if you're interested in learning a bunch more. Um, I've helped him edit some of that and work on that content. Uh, I also play music, and I really like cooking. There's lots of other stuff. This is my dog, Wilbur. And you could see the mountains, but it's not going to work on the screen. That's my motorcycle. But that's kind of what the mountains look like on the way down to um, South Carolina from here. Um, like I said, most days I do websites for craft breweries. Um, we work exclu exclusively in the brewing industry and have about 50 clients uh, kind of scattered across the East Coast and all the way to Colorado, and then two in UK. And we do the uh, e -com we do e-commerce for them as well as websites and you know, basic online marketing stuff. Um, I'm also a, a member of the Roots.io team, so I work on a lot of the Roots tools um, like Sage, the starter theme, Bedrock. Um, don't do so much work on Trellis, but I highly recommend checking that out. They're all free tools. And then uh, for about three years, I've been very seriously doing JavaScript development. I did React for, I've probably been doing React for about two years, I think, the Gutenberg decision to go with React was really great for me because it felt natural. Um, I know that it was kind of upsetting for some people, but I think that we've ended up in a really good way, and I think that I'll be able to show some of that off here today as well. So really quick, I just to get away from the code, um, how, do we, how do we feel about Gutenberg right now? Um, are we excited? Maybe like raise your hand if you're excited, like if you played around. OK, so like less people. Who's scared? You should all be really scared. I'm very scared. <laughs> um, confused. Uh, I think that that's also valid to raise your hand. And um, you know, if you really have never heard of Gutenberg, um, unless you're my girlfriend sitting in the back because she's watching me, you could go to John's talk, because John's going to give a really good thing, and I won't be mad if you get up and leave. Um, are, are we getting ready for Gutenberg? Is, is anybody currently trying to get ready like actively at their agency? OK. Or, or you know, in their work. Cool. So I think you know, right now it's a little complicated because everything's in beta right now. And still, I mean, it's stable, but it's, you know, it has you know, all these installs and still two stars on, on the repo, and it's pretty scary. But regardless, it's happening. So we have to get ready for it. And as developers, we have to know how we're going to move over all this custom functionality that we've had. I know a lot of us, I, I'm, I'm included, a lot of us use advanced custom fields to keep track of metadata on pages. And um, there are some really exciting things about Gutenberg. When I was first getting into it, I was very upset because I was like, this is going to take me a long time. Um, now I feel like it's going to be worth it. And for us, we're kind of a platform. When Gutenberg launches and I have enough time to move all of our clients over, I can very confidently say, for us, it's going to feel a lot like a 
2.0 for a lot of our clients. Um, so I'm personally really excited. I'm also scared for the amount of work that I have to do. So let's talk about Gutenberg blocks for a minute. I'm, I'm hoping that we all have a little bit of experience, but this is, you know, you're going to go add a block and you've got all these kind of, um, I've got a bunch of example blocks right here from um, Zach Gordon's example block repo, which I will also link to in my slides. Um, it's a really good way to get into this block development. And my block is a combination of all of the most complicated, possibly complicated parts of the WordPress Gutenberg API, except for the sidebar API. So I, I, I'm not going to ask all of you to have the prerequisite of even building a block today, because I'm going to explain some stuff. But I will say, at the workshop that I taught, our prerequisite was that everybody had built a Gutenberg block because we had another workshop where people were building it. Zach Gordon has an example block re repository on GitHub. It's really great just to look through because there's some really simple examples to get you started. So Gutenberg blocks are modular and usually independent. And what I mean by that is that you can move them around. And also, they, e they each keep track of their own data. Um, they're going to be registered in JavaScript. There's some methods via PHP, and there's going to be some more methods via PHP. Uh, if you want my personal opinion, don't really mess with that. It's not, um, I don't think it's very useful, um, because you're going to be building these things in JavaScript. So uh, to me, it makes sense to register your blocks in JavaScript. Usually, um, these blocks are built with React, or you're going to have to use a combination of React or whatever framework or whatever regular JavaScript you want to use. Um, all of my examples today are going to be in ES 2017, DS6, whatever latest JavaScript you want to use. Um, blocks have two different types. This is a super important distinction to make. So I'm going to talk about it for a second when we get to um, uh, kind of a little bit more of the code example. But static block types store their own data. And what that means is that when you go in and you go to add a block into the back end, and I'm going to show you here in a minute, but when you go to add a block in the back end, th that data is saved to the post content. So it gets saved locally into the post, right? It's not global. It's not across different areas of the site. It's in the content, the actual content of the post. Um, there's also block types called dynamic block types. And to me, dynamic block types are where we start getting into the advanced custom field world and where we start getting into this. A lot more options for where your data comes from and where your data is saved is really powerful. But what I will say with dynamic block types, unless you program it to be this way, you cannot have multiple um, and you're going to see it here in a minute. But let's just say you have your source of your data coming from a meta, like meta attribute, and then you put two blocks on the same page that both get that same meta value. That's going to get kind of weird with the editing experience and when you hit save. So just be careful with dynamic blocks. Um, that said, uh, they can be used in so many different ways. And when they're rendered on the page, you can actually make it so that it's regenerated. So again, I'm going to say static blocks are saved into WP content, which means when you hit update, it gets saved into the post. And then when your post is displayed, it gets shown. Right? That makes sense? That, doesn't, that means if you have dynamic data, you can't use a static block, because it's just hard saved into the post. You have to use a dynamic block. A dynamic block can register, you know, have new data. And we're going to see this here in just a second. Um, blocks can come from a lot of different data sources, like I mentioned. Dynamic blocks is literally like writing little snippets of PHP of what you want the block to look like. And we're going to see that. But static blocks also have a lot of different data sources and types. You can get data from, you can like, you know, have a text field or a number and kind of change around all that. Those uh, options are available in the API. But I'm not going to go over this. Um, OK, so if you could raise your hand really quick. And have we worked with React or JSX? OK, about half the room. Uh, have we made a WP API endpoint ever, a custom WordPress API endpoint? Have you ever made a Gutenberg block? OK, 
Uh, have you ever, are you using Gutenberg in production? I don't even, I actually am not allowed to raise my hand. <laughs> um, <laughs> I am not, although I will be adding it to my, to my personal website. Oh, I, actually, that's a lie. I built a blog with Gutenberg. Um, it kind of works. So, <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, at this point, I, I will say I wanted to cover everything on this page. And I don't know, I'm, I might just kind of not talk about the API endpoint, but I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give everybody a link to the slides and you can see the code examples. And I think a lot of things will click. But uh, due to time, you're going to have to just trust me on a couple things. So the block that we're going to build today and that's basically already built, I'm going to show you the code that powers this block, is a very simple block. And this block is made to basically get some points across, um, but it's insanely over-engineered. So if you are ever going to do what I'm doing, yes, it is definitely the right way. It is like way too far the right way. But it's a really good way to show some APIs, some, some really cool ways to build some functionality. And this, this block code that we have on GitHub is is a really good recipe for some pretty custom stuff that, that you all might need to do if you're, for example, using advanced custom fields or something like that. So we're going to be using very simple JSX components. And for those who don't know, JSX is a templating language that is built into React. It's, um, you can build a bunch of crazy templates, but with React, JSX makes it a lot easier to build components and build um, markup, basically, and separate your markup from your code. Um, if you went to the fantastic Vue.js talk yesterday, um, there was some good examples of uh, kind of putting logic in your uh, markup and having a templating language be a little bit smarter. Um, we, I'm a very big proponent of dumb Dumb components, they're called. And it just means components that render data that you give them, they do not do anything else. They do not do logic or anything. So we're not going to be showing that. We're going to be doing that where it belongs for React. Um, we also have an API endpoint that we've built as part of this um, for basically a ticker. And so what this block does is if you can imagine at the bottom of a page, you might just want to have a little heart button. Like, have we ever seen on Medium how there's like claps or whatever? This is a heart button. And when you click it, it adds a like or a heart. It's a react. It's a reaction. And that's it. That's all the block does. Um, king of over-engineering. We're, we're going to use uh, WP Data, which is a new API in the back end of WordPress, thanks to Gutenberg. Gutenberg uses it internally. WP Data is basically React, uh, Reacts, um, well, it's not really, it doesn't even have to be React, but Redux, I don't know if we've ever heard of Redux. It's a state, it's an application state management methodology. It's a tiny framework. It's 50 lines of code. But it basically is just says very explicit things about what data is on the page right there. And it helps us build um, applications. I'll explain this a little bit, but also Gutenberg uses WPA, WP data constantly. And it's actually really cool to see it watching. You can do something called subscribe to data stores. It's, this is just for on the page. You can do something called a subscribe. And you can actually add that call in to subscribe and watch it as it updates. So you can see all the updates that, that Gutenberg makes. It's really cool. Um, the other thing I just want to say is you're going to see me using the WCEU 2018 Gutenberg Reacts. It didn't make sense for me to change all the code over, just for an example. So that is also probably an over-engineered post-meta key, but nobody's ever going to use that for their plugin. So that's where we're going to store this counter. And literally, it's just a number, and we're just going to increment it. So the process of building a block like this that has a lot of moving parts, and, and actually, let me just let me hold on. Let me just show you an example of this of this block really quick. Um, press local, so you can see this site. I'm going to go to the individual post. Check it out. 
Whoa. Seriously, that's it. That's all it does. And if we look in the back end here, my password is password. If we look in the back end here, <clears throat> there's our meta value. So let's just say I wanted to, then uh, you obviously would not have this on the back end of your site, but this is just so that we can see that we can update the meta value too. If I hit update, look how fast that is. These are the cool parts about Gutenberg, right? Like that was instant because there was an Ajax call that just happened there. Nothing had to hit save, the page wasn't refreshed. It's so awesome. And if, and if you haven't seen, I mean, you know, adding things, why is it making me log in again? Adding things, um, here actually, you know what I just remembered? I just remembered that I haven't turned on screen recording. So just everybody hold that thought. Sorry. All right. Wow, save me. Um, that means that if I didn't record my screen because there's so much live code, I wouldn't allow this on WPTV. And I want to make sure this one gets recorded. So if I want to add like a regular block, and I don't even know if we've ever even seen this, so I'm just going to show you really quick. Like there's some really common blocks. Like I can put some text goes here, and I can you know make this center aligned, and I can move this block up, and it's just such a quick reactive amazing experience. Um, I still think there's some holes in, in this compared to what, what you know, we use, but um, it's just so fast the way everything happens. And, and I think it's really exciting. So again, I changed the meta value in the back end just so you could see there's somewhere in the database, but I'm going to click it again. This thing doesn't even check to see if you've already clicked it. So you could go back and refresh the page 100 times. I would probably just use a cookie or something like that if I didn't need authentication. But anyways, um, that's all this block does. So what we're going to do, our process in building this block, and what I want to walk you all through is registering the block, because you have to tell Gutenberg on that page. When you load Gutenberg up, you have to tell Gutenberg that a new custom block is available. We're going to go through the block attributes and meta fields, which in our case is just one meta field coming from the database. We're going to look at how the front end block output happens, which is, again, because we're using a dynamic block, we're getting PHP to render this block. <clears throat> and I'll show you that. We're going to build some dumb components that get data from smart components or containers. Um, it sounds very fancy, but it's just a thing that provides a thing that has markup with some information. So all, all of this. We're going to register a new WP data store. And that store is, again, a Redux store. Does anybody have experience with Redux here? OK. It's going to be fine. Um, it's really cool. Um, so I'll cover it really quick. But basically, uh, we're gonna have, we have to tell WordPress that there's a store that we're going to save information to. In our case, it's, again, insanely simple because we're just making a number go up. And in fact, we're not making a number go up in the back end or in the front end or, or anything like that. The, 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 the number goes up by an API request. And that's server side only doing the logic. You're asking the server to, to make that happen. So then we're going to build this API endpoint, which I think I'm actually going to skip over because that has nothing to do with Gutenberg. But I'm going to explain how it works. Then you have to build your smart components. And those are the components that wrap your dumb components and provide them with data. Smart components can also be used for actions. For example, there's a component around the heart that when I click it, all it knows to do is to handle that click event, right? I've been clicked. Now I'm going to do something. And after it does that thing, it returns data back to the little child component that, in, that has that data that it's reading. We're going to see it in a second. I think it'll make more sense. So now we're going to do all live code, because there's really no way to show this stuff off. Um, but this is how I feel. And Sarah asked me today if I had finished my slides. And this was me finishing my slides. So basically, at this point, I, I feel a lot more comfortable just kind of explaining how this is all built. And so I'm, um, for sake of simplicity, I'm going to be using um, uh, Visual Studio Code, which is a fantastic free editor. Um, it is actually from Microsoft. 
So you would think that I wouldn't think it was great, but it's really fantastic and it's, it's uh, very fast. I personally use PHP Storm in my day-to-day -day usage, but that's because it's an IDE and it knows everything about my code. Um, this is really a great quick code editor and it is, it's amazing that it's free. I would pay for this code editor. Um, where do I want to start? So I'm going to just say this is a plugin, okay? So we have a plugin file and the plugin file includes some PHP that we need. You can see that it has a file that, in, that enqueues JavaScript and CSS on the page, right? Because we need JavaScript to make things happen because it's all JavaScript. And you'll actually see in this enqueue scripts file, we have a couple separate functions. I mean, basically, this talk has homework, which means if you want to go home and peruse all the code, you should do that. Can we all see this text, or would we like me to bump it up a little bit? OK. Bump it a little bit? OK, yeah, the, those in the back. Um, yeah, no worries. I, 225 might be a little too big. Um, is that good, or do we want to go up a little more? OK. I feel like it should be a little bigger. Sorry, I'm, it sounds like I'm listening to you, but I'm not. All right, that's going to be so good. So if we look here, we actually enqueue block editor assets separately from the front end assets, right? You have your block assets, and that includes registering the block and includes the logic when you actually have the block moving. Then you're going to go down here. You can see we've got some editor-only styles. To be honest, there's not a lot in there. We have um, assets here that we're going to be including on the front end, and this is the, the kind of kicker right here. So um, the front end assets are enqueued in this enqueue front end assets. And it's really just a JavaScript file. Uh, I should say the build process that's powering this comp compilation, transpiling, blah, 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 it's a Webpack file that comes from Zach Gordon's block example. I wanted to keep it uh, in line with his course and his stuff <laughs> due, to, due to the workshop. But it's, again, it's really great. It works. Um, I would probably build my own for a library, but it, it's a very good, simple Webpack file. So we all understand that what enqueuing scripts means is that we're putting stuff on the page so that JavaScript knows to run, right? I hope. <clears throat> so from there, I, basically, I can just show you the first step, which is going to be registering a block. This is, again, ES6, ES7 looking JavaScript. So I'm using constant and let instead of var to define my variables. Um, we can go into why I would do that later. See me afterwards. Um, it's, really not, it's really not that crazy. If you look at this, though, you will see that I need a couple things. There's a couple things that need to be on the page. And really what I'm doing is I'm requiring stuff from WP's global JavaScript object, which we may have used in the past. You know, It has a bunch of backbone stuff. It has a bunch of media player stuff. It has a lot of stuff. I use WordPress APIs as much as I can because it's there. Not because I love them. It's because they're there. And it means they're always going to be there. That's the crux of the WordPress decision, right? Am I going to use WordPress? OK, I'm going to use these things forever. So we have constant um, being used to declare these things. And I just want to say, you, you do need some things. These things depend on what kind of Gutenberg block you're building. Because this Gutenberg block uses a text control for that meta value. You saw that little meta value that we changed in the back end, went from 18 to 20. That's a text control. So I had to also require that. This documentation is actually pretty good in the Gutenberg GitHub repository. So I'm not going to explain what all of those functions do. So registering a block type is pretty simple. The first thing that we need to do is we need to give it some kind of namespace or some kind of identifier. This is actually what's written into the code. And uh, when I say written into the code, it's what I mean is if I show you the back end of this post, here really quick, going to go into the editor. And if I edit it as HTML, wait, hold on. 
If I, oh, that's what uh, would happen. If I converted this back to a classic block, right, you would actually see this as the identifier for that block. I don't know if anybody's done that yet, but when you, it, it actually like pulls those things kind of together. And, and this is another good example. Another good example, king of examples. And oh, it's not going to show you. If I if I if I went into the database, the post of the database, you would see a, something that looked like that. Uh, it would be a comment, and it would be like type WP core, and then it would say text block or something like that. So Gutenberg is actually parsed. <laughs> this is when we, it gets to be a little absurd. Gutenberg is actually parsed by HTML comments. So these comments are um, these comments are what delineates what the block is. And if you deactivate the plugin, your content doesn't go away, right? That's the beauty of it. Uh, at least with static blocks, it's because that content is still there. It's rendered into the it's rendered into the thing. But we need some kind of identifier so that the parser knows. Oh, this is the React block. I need to render this code. Um, Again, the prerequisite for this is that we know it, all of what I'm talking about. So sorry again for, you know, I would say go in, explore with Gutenberg. You can see how that all works. So I'm going to run through this really quick. We need to give it a title, a description. You can give it a category, which kind of like uh, categorizes it inside the block adding interface. Uh, an icon, I used a heart. This can come from dash icons. So that's why uh, WordPress's dash icons has a heart. So you can put in a dash icons value for that. You can give it a background color if you want. Um, there's some keywords. This is if you were to put a Gutenberg plugin like on the repository, they can scan this when you register your blocks. Um, attributes. This is a very important little bit of information, but it tells Gutenberg everything about where your data comes from. But all we're going to give it right now is the amount of reacts. So attributes, and then you give it the value. And then you tell Gutenberg what kind of data that value is. And that's right here. So if you follow me, reacts is a, uh, I could have called it reactions, right? Like reactions is a thing. And that thing is an integer. And the default is 0. And the source is meta. And the meta is this meta key. Does that make sense? We're telling the block the meta comes from this meta key. Then you have two very important functions. We have an edit function and we have a save function. The edit function, um, and this is fancy fat arrow shorthand for like, hey, we're going to pass all the properties we need from the data because Gutenberg automatically gives you data. And we're going to pass it into this set of uh, things. Man, I really wish that this code was easier to Well, it is easier for me to read, but it's because I know how the Gutenberg container works. Again, those, exa those simple examples in Zach Gordon's repo is really going to help kind of make this all hit home. But if we, look at the, uh, if we look at the way this works, this is basically an if statement to say that if the block is selected, right? if we've selected the block in the back end, and edit is for the back end, and, and save is for the front end. So save is what gets put in the front end, and edit is what gets put in the back end. If so, we need to render these things. First thing is, if it's selected, we need to render an inspector controls box with a panel body. And again, this is in the documentation to look how this is built. But this is how you build your sidebar interface to edit information. And then the text control has three things. It has a label, it has a value, and those reacts. Again, this is, this is looking familiar. This is the reacts piece of data. And then this is the value of our thing. And then an on change handler. And that on change handler just says, when you change the text box, set attributes, which is a Gutenberg function, send the reacts to set attributes, and then it'll set reacts for you. So it's basically just basically saying, when you change the value, you're going to save it into the database. And Gutenberg handles all of that for you. 
So in the back end, you don't have to do anything. You tell it what kind of data you have, and it'll do it for you. You can also run a lot of custom functions if, for example, Gutenberg doesn't provide you with what you need. This, though, is a very important line. And this is what actually renders that, uh, that the heart, like the reacts. And that wrapper component is right here. And it's extremely simple. This is what JSX looks like. Please don't be scared. It's in a, it's in a different file because we're importing it in the other file. But it's, it's just a div with a class name. And then we also give it another component, a heart. And we give it also a count. But do you see how we're passing reacts into this reacts right here? So we're, we're, this is a dumb component, right? This is a wrapper that, that all it does is render some information. And we give it that information via the fact that Gutenberg already handles all the data for you. It knows what the value of Reacts is. Believe it or not, internally, WP data is running to make all that work. But that's all Gutenberg stuff, uh, as in we don't mess with that. That's all core Gutenberg that's doing that. The save function is very important if you have a static block. So for example, if we have that text block, if you look at like the text block in core, the one that we just add paragraph text to, the save function for that runs WP auto P on it, like the content function that it would normally run. And it just saves that markup right into the block. And that's it. And then it's done, right? We're actually saving nothing into the content because we're doing that all on the PHP side. So we're going to see that in a second. Is anybody feeling comfortable following me? Because we have about, I don't know, 20 minutes, and I've covered about an eighth of everything I need to cover. <laughs> it's going to be fine. So JSX might look very scary and confusing, but this is actually very clean. And if you read it, it's like you might not understand the syntax right now, but you do kind of get that I have a heart on the page and a count on the page. And you can see where those things come from when you see that at the top of the file, it says that those are imported. So right now, I'm just going to show you these dumb components really quick because I just want you to see how they work. The heart is very simple as well. It takes a class, well, it takes a uh, Argument, basically, props are basically like arguments. Like if you think of short codes, kind of, it takes an argument of active. And then we use this class names library to add the class of active if active is true. And that's it. That's all it does. It renders an icon and it has an active class or not, or it doesn't have an active class. Does that kind of make sense? That's when we click the heart, it gives it the active class. For the counter, it's also a super dumb component. If I go into my components here, you can see that happening right here, right? We're just, we've got a count, we've got a wrap, and then we just put the count on the page. So it's nothing too crazy. But we separate these things because we use them in multiple places. You might be like, no, Julian, we don't use them in multiple places, but we do. Because the cool thing about this block is that the block actually renders data separately via React on the front end and on the back end, but differently. So the reason why we have dumb components is so that we can share the same exact markup with the back end and the front end. And we're going to see that in just a minute. So yeah, because you noticed that the heart was like, it does something right on the front end, but it also appears on the back end. So we don't have to write that markup twice. We have a separate components library. Um, in our source file. And like, so our blocks are kind of right here, and our components are here, and those things are separate. We just call them when we need them where we need them. Um, so if you had five different ways to show this block off, you, should, you could still show the block off and only write the markup one time. OK. So that's kind of confusing. But we've registered the block. Now, when we save the block, it knows what to do. Gutenberg handles the saving of the data, and it also knows that it's on that post. So really quick, I just want to show you the front end data of the, the front end PHP that gets <coughs> rendered. OK, this is basically just saying, like, hey, oh yeah, we have to tell Gutenberg that the, the block exists. 
with this register reacts block in the back end. And it just says register block type. Do you know, does that look familiar? That's our namespace from the registering the block in JavaScript. And then this is, this is what you do for dynamic blocks. You just give it a render callback. So it says, OK, when I'm rendered, when, when the Gutenberg parser hits this block type, render, run, run this function. And this function is really simple. This function just spits out some basic PHP. I used output buffering for a lot of stuff because I like the way that it looks. But if you have um, the Reacts here, you can see uh, we just grab post meta. This looks familiar, right? This is all PHP, so we're not super scared. Um, get post meta. We're getting the idea. Well, yeah, look at that. There's our meta key. And then we spit it out here. Why do I even have this? Because JavaScript. Does anybody know? It's because some people don't have JavaScript enabled. And sometimes Google doesn't have JavaScript enabled. There's a lot of things that don't have JavaScript. Um, there's also accessibility things. Some screen re readers can easily disable JavaScript. So this is a backup. And if you notice, I've called this div the Reacts block wrap temp counter. And that's because all it, all it says, and you probably won't even be able to see it, because React is, React is so dang fast. But if I view the post really fast, do you see that? You see that flash? That flash of text is actually React init initiating, grabbing the value, and popping it on the page. That's how fast it is. I mean, we are running in a local environment, but look at that. Holy crap. But anyways, that other one right there is basically for non you know, for, for like an SEO value or for uh, somebody who doesn't have JavaScript. All right. Cool. So you're going to have to just trust me. When I click this, it goes to an API endpoint. Feel free to look at the API endpoint. The, end, the API endpoint is so simple. The API endpoint grabs the value from the database. It pluses one to the value. And then it returns the new value. OK? That's all it does. React then grabs that and pops it on the page when I click it. Why do I do it server side? Because if you had 10,000 people clicking this at the same time, the most accurate count is from the server. It's never from the client, right? Because the client would see 23, and it would hit a heart. Imagine being on a phone with a really bad internet connection in South Africa, and 100 people just liked the post, but it takes you a minute to load that AJAX call and come back. It would be, it would be 24, even if 100 people have hit it, right? So we asked the server to run that logic. So you're just going to have to trust me that there's an API endpoint. When you click it, it happens. I'm going to show you that by showing you the front end JavaScript. I really think this is all we need, because I know we only have a little bit more time. Looking at the front end JavaScript, you can see I have constant create element and render. OK, if you've done any React development, this looks ridiculously familiar. It's because it is exactly a wrapper for React. In that, if you actually go to look in the source code for WP element, create element is React's create element. They do import create element, create element equals create element. That's it. But it's a wrapper because if something changes down the road, your code doesn't break when React updates their code, right? Beauty of backwards compatibility. So we have a couple other components. And this is where you're going to see our smart wrapper and our clicker. And I'm going to go through these things in a minute. But oh, yeah, this is our store registering. All right, I'm not going to explain Redux really quick. I'm going to explain that at the end if we have time. <clears throat> but basically, this is our code. And again, king of over-engineering, but I just want you to see this is how I would properly do it. This isn't that crazy. We're getting an element by its ID, right? So we're going to, it's like jQuery. We're just, we're, we're getting an element, right? And that element's called React's block. And if it helps, I will show you the index, right? Right here, this, this ID. So we're grabbing that ID. <clears throat> Oh, yeah. This is how I know the post ID. Do you see, you see that? This is a dynamic block, right? So this dynamic block runs. It pops this on the page right here. It grabs the ID of the page. And now I know the ID of the page, so I can ask the endpoint 
what the count is, right? I can ask the endpoint how many it has. OK, if we have a post ID, which we should, because it should have rendered one, we're going to run an API request. This, is, this should look pretty good if we do any JavaScript. <clears throat> this API request also, thank you very much, WordPress, is from wp.api request. You might not know that these things exist, and you might be including a ton of JavaScript that you really don't need, because WordPress already has an API request tool that is backwards compatible and works with other browsers. Don't use Fetch or Axios or another library. You, all you have to use is this WP API request. That's, that's all you need. And it's included in the global, global WP object. Some of this stuff is new, so don't feel bad if you're like, oh, I haven't been using this for the last three years. It wasn't there three years ago. But it's there now. So we're, this should look also familiar. We're grabbing posts from the API. We're asking it for the post ID, right? Then we're getting the post back. We're making sure the post has a meta object. This should look pretty familiar if you know what a re response from the WP API looks like. This is the meta value. Ha, ha, ha. This might look pretty good. And then we're using this dispatch thing, which I'm going to explain in a minute. But it basically just says, we got some data. Now you know about it. It's ridiculously explicit. And that's why I'm saying this all looks really over-engineered. Because normally with job jQuery, I would just be like, OK, we have it. Now you know, make the number 22. But I'm not, because I'm crazy. And then we're going to mount this component. And I don't know if you're noticing here, but ha ha, there's our post ID. So we got our post ID, and we're, we're popping it into this clicker. So the reason why we have this is because we want to make sure to tell the clicker the post ID to update when it goes and does it. So let's look at those components really quick. And these are our smart components. <laughs> This is so complicated. <laughs> we have a clicker, and we have a smart wrapper. I want to show you a smart wrapper first. <clears throat> no, I'm going to explain. Never mind. I'm going to explain Redux to you really quick. OK, Redux is really simple. When I give somebody a high five, imagine that there's a counter that has to be counting that, right? So for example, Greg over there, I'm going to call him out. If I give Craig a high five, there's a couple things that happen. <clears throat> I might want to give Greg more than one high fives, and we might have somebody over here. For example, Brent is counting the amount of high fives, right? So high five, high five, high five. Obviously, like all of you guys can tell that the high five happened. And if you were paying attention, you might be counting how many five five high fives happened, right? But if you weren't paying attention, you might not know. So you might think that there were two high fives, and you might think that there were three high fives happening. Brent's the high five counter, though. So Brent should know for sure, right? There's three. So the cool thing is Redux is this overcomplicated, crazy, like declaratory framework that basically says somebody needs to be keeping track of the high fives. Somebody needs to know how to get the high fives back. And you need to have a function to grab all of these things. And you need to declare them explicitly. So the reason why I explained it in that way of high fives is because if you look at me registering my store, which is this Redux register, you're actually going to see that I really don't have very many complicated things happening. But we have to declare it. So there's three different things that happen. First of all, there's an action. It's the giving of the high five. For us, it's two. we have two of them. We have activate, and we have set reacts, and set reacts is just basically like, hey, tell the component how many reacts we have, right? which we get from the API. The reducer is what allows, is what makes the change to tell the store, the state, that a change has happened. <laughs> I know that sounds really complicated, but again, we have an action. If the action type is set reacts, we're going to set the reacts to action reacts. Don't worry about all this other stuff. This is ES6 spread operator stuff. Don't, don't worry about it. Just 
You do need to know this stuff to be building these things with these tools, but don't worry about it right now. Just look at the fact that I'm, I'm putting an action. If the action is set reacts, set the reacts, okay? Action reacts. Get the action from, get the reacts from the action. Same thing with this, activate. But instead of passing data here, we're just switching a, a Boolean. So basically, somebody else is keeping track of whether or not anybody has high-fived. I high-five Greg. We're going to run that somebody high-fived. I know it sounds totally crazy, but your, your application knows exactly where it is at any given time. Has anybody high-fived anybody yet? Oh, ask the store, right? The last part of Redux is selectors. And selectors grab data from this store. And I know this sounds like really complicated, but the store literally looks like this. OK, does that make anybody feel a little better? We're basically saying, like, have we activated anything? No, not by default. Oh, sorry. Some of you might not be able to see this. I apologize. Not by default, but have it, has anybody high-fived? Change it to true. That's all the store is doing. OK? Selectors grab things from the store. So re get reacts is a function. It's called get reacts because what we're doing is getting the amount of reacts. And all it does is grab the state reacts, OK? So get reacts. How many reacts do we have? Brent, how many reacts do we have? Well, high fives. How many high fives do we have? We have three. OK, three. Awesome. Amazing. Sorry, that wasn't a very good. Uh, <laughs> good job. Thank you for not returning false data. You didn't find the key in the fucking thing. Sorry, I can't say that. You didn't find the, thing, the key in the thing, so you can't return any data, right? So we also have an is activated. And again, this is how I know if the heart's clickable or not, right? Has it been activated? No, nobody's clicked it. Nobody's clicked it. Click, activate. That's been set. This has been changed. Now it's true. OK, yeah, it's active. So I know it sounds a little crazy, but in massive applications, I promise you, I've built a Redux application with over 400 keys. And when you have access to the exact state of your data, not only do you know where everything is and how everything feels, but if you've wired everything up correctly, your store, your application never shows the wrong data. It's not allowed to show the wrong data. And the coolest thing is that if you start building applications with Redux, you know Gutenberg's back button? All they do is remove the last action. They keep a log of the actions that happen, and they just remove the last action. And so the, the application says, oh, the state changed, right? Our, our information changed, and we no longer have an extra high five. It removes itself. It removing itself triggers the U, UI to basically triggers the UI to re-render, and it re-renders with the exact data we had. So you can actually go back in time and, and see how people are using your data if you logged all this stuff. It's, it's really powerful and very exciting. And now that I've explained it, I'm just going to say all the clicker does, <laughs> it's really not that crazy. When you click it on click, right, handle click, first of all, don't do anything we're not supposed to. We're going to see if this has been activated. If it's been activated, don't do anything, right? It's our, somebody's already clicked it. Don't do anything. If not, dispatch the activate, which is going to make it active, right? Run an API request. This is our custom API. We're hitting this increment at a custom API endpoint. Right here with the post ID. It's just literally grabbing the post meta, adding a plus one to that meta, returning that back. Dispatch, set reacts, which we're telling it, OK, this is how many reacts we have. It re-renders. Does this kind of make sense what I'm doing here? Yes. Awesome. So really, that's all this thing does. But you can see the magical part of this is that it gets the data via an API request. It sets the data via an API request. And it knows exactly where it is at any given moment. So the crazy example is not here. But you can see why, with this as a foundation for building your advanced Gutenberg blocks, you have 
a load of tools available to you from WordPress. I'm, I'm using one non-WordPress provided library, and that's a very popular library called Class Names. And that's literally a library that adds a class to a box. That's all it does. It's good to use because you, know, you might need to get crazy with it. But seriously, all this stuff is provided to you from WordPress to build very reactive, smart applications. And Gutenberg can handle that. They can handle those kind of dynamic blocks. And you can handle the use case of Google not being able to render the JavaScript. So I think that hopefully touches on a lot of points to where you might be afraid of moving something over to a block. But if it makes sense for it to go in a block like this might, and you might have had to build some crazy custom thing for user interaction and all this stuff. Just know, if you can write the JavaScript, which you know, might be the next step, which some of you need, if you can write the JavaScript, you can build really awesome stuff like this with WordPress provided things. Um, that's all I have for the code. So I'm happy to, I know that we're kind of getting there. There's a repository link right here. I'm just going to go to Zach Gordon's thing. These slides will be available. I'll tweet them out. Um, this is the link that you want. It's pretty short. It's zgordon slash WCEU2018. That workshop is still being edited, unfortunately. It is not on WordPress TV. But I spend, instead of 10 minutes, I got 45 minutes to talk about Redux. So the high five example is actually from that, but I got way more time. So there's way more time. I explained everything in detail, line by line. I actually co live coded line by line all of these components. That said, go back. You're good. <laughs> go back to that. Um, go back to that repo and make sure that you use the branch called completed because the master branch is actually what I used to start teaching people. It was blank because we all did it. We all wrote the code together. So go to the completed branch. Um, that's about it. But if we have some questions, I, we have about three minutes. <laughs> yeah? Um, what would be the best way to go about resetting the high fives to zero to the next day automatically? To the next day automatically. So the question is, is what would be the west, best, the west way? What would be the best way to reset the high fives or the reacts or whatever back to zero automatically the next day? That's a great question. Um, I would use the infamous WP cron to go and find all the posts that have that value and reset them all to zero. Um, I don't know how you run your cron, but I have a cron job running my cron, which is really common, I think. My cron job runs every 15 minutes. You could have it run every minute or every three minutes or something like that. That's probably how I would run that, yeah. I use the WordPress things. Greg. So our friend in South Africa collected that by the time he gets back to it, it very well may be 6.5 years plus. Yeah. Yeah, so the question, well, the thing that he just said was, is it correct that basically if my friend from South Africa with a really slow internet connection hit the button and it said 20, but 100 people clicked it in time, will they get the new value, which is 121, right? Yeah. There's plus the 100 plus the 20. Uh, absolutely. And that's why we use the server to do it, because the server is going to respond with a new value. We're, we're, we're giving them that classic uh, activated, like they feel like they hearted it, but the number didn't change. If I were to do it the real way, I would change the number in the back end for them and then overwrite the number once I got the new, once I got the new value, right? So like I would change it to be like 22, boop. 23, 100 people clicked it. In the time they get the response back, 123. Does that kind of make sense? But that would have taken longer to build, and I'm lazy. Go ahead. Does Gutenberg have any way of continuing any built-in way of continuing to scale? Does Gutenberg have any built-in way of uh, consuming external APIs? <laughs> no. That API, not not any special. Not any special functionality other than like that API request, which actually isn't even part of Gutenberg. It's used in different places in WordPress now. Um, doing other, calling other APIs, I would highly suggest, again, king of over engineering, um, I would highly suggest building your own API point to go grab something from an external API, process it in PHP, and then ask JavaScript to take care of it. 
There's some blocks for that one to make sense. For example, of a, we a weather app might not make sense. But the other thing that you get is you can cache that value in a transient. I know that I'm going off on a soapbox here, but let's just say you hit an API really crazy, like a weather API, and you exceed your API limits, your Gutenberg block is broken. But if you tran even if you set a you have a bunch of zip codes that you that you have it by zip code or whatever, and you bring it back in that weather API, you can at least cache that value so that you're not overhitting your API requests. Does that make does that help? Okay. I would say defer to PHP. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that with Redux would be a good example. I kind of wanted to rip it out for this, but I think it's worth explaining. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, is can I do all of this stuff with dynamic blocks just with PHP? Yes, you can. I've never done it, so I can't tell you the exact ways, but so many people asked for that that they were like, okay, we need to have this possible. Um, it's actually funny because if you do it the JavaScript way, it runs the PHP way in the back end anyways. Surprise, surprise, WordPress. I mean, WordPress has to be aware, um, but I will say one point on that. It sucks because WordPress isn't aware of dynamic block values. You can't go to the API and ask WordPress what a block value is. It doesn't know what blocks are on the page until it renders them. So we haven't fixed that problem yet. And just what I mean by that is there might be a point where you're like, oh, I want to get a data value from a block. Store it in post meta if you want to get a data value from a block. Because if not, you're going to be parsing the entire content of that page. Boo. Anyways, OK, that's it. That's all I got. Thank you. Oh, yeah. One